This is the Ferrari 430 Scuderia. Scuderia meaning stable in Italian, specifically a stable for racing horses. And what a racing horse this V8 powered naturally aspirated track weapon turned out to be. Perfected by Formula One ace Michael Schumacher, 100 kilograms lighter than the standard 430 and featuring all the latest period F1 developed technology, the Scuderia, affectionately known as the Scud, is today highly regarded by Ferrari collectors and represents the epitome of old school Ferrari performance. This is Drive Every Ferrari and this week I'm going to look in forensic detail at this 430 Scuderia kindly lent to the channel by fellow YouTuber JM on Cars. How fast is it? What makes it special? How does it compare to the Challenge Stradale? What's it like to drive on today's roads, its history, and where does it fit in terms of Ferrari's greatest ever V8 road cars? All this and more will be revealed in this week's episode. Sound good? Okay, let's get on with it. Now, first of all, cards on the table, the 430 is not my favorite looking V8 Ferrari. In fact, it's not even close. I don't like the rear Enzo homage lights and the pinched headlights. It's always been a bit of a bland one for me, but that doesn't stop the Scuderia variant being pretty bloody sensational in the flesh, mainly because it's more aggressive, more purposeful, and it has all those extra flourishes that I like when it comes to making a race car for the road. It's the difference between the 599 GTB, bland, and the 599 GTO, maximum winky visage. The Scud is a very special car because it represents the turning point between old school and modern Ferrari V8s. It's a two-seater Berlinetta, a race-inspired version of the 430 and the equivalent of the Challenge Stradale before it, and the Speciale and the Pista that followed it. It is therefore Ferrari V8 royalty and it demands your respect. The Challenge Stradale made do with just over 400 brake horsepower in 2003, and its high revving engine delivered only 275 foot-pounds of torque, which explains the lack of grunt at low revs. 0-60 was 4.1 seconds, but it took nearly another 10 to hit 124 miles an hour, and top speed, even with its slippery body, was 186 miles an hour. Just look at that weight though, less than 1300 kilograms. The 430 Scuderia improved in all areas except weight, putting on 69 kilograms, but the engine now delivered over 500 brake horsepower, which knocked half a second off the 0-60 time and put it into the threes, making it a genuine supercar. All that aerodynamic work and rear diffuser allowed the Scud to shave off two seconds from the longer distance 0-124 miles an hour time, and just look at the top speed, just shy of 200 miles an hour. But if you want to see the dividends of technical development in Formula One, you need only look at the Speciale, which jumped almost 100 brake horsepower, added more torque, smashed the 0 to 60 time and 124 miles an hour time, and took the top speed to over 200 miles an hour. The first hot variant of the V8 mid engine Ferrari came with the 348 GT Competizione based on the GT Championship race car. It created a formula lighter, noisier, track focused that Ferrari has continued to this day with the Pista and to a lesser extent the Assetto Fiorano pack for the SF90 and 296 GTB. The Challenge Stradale seen here it was an incredible track weapon, balanced, raw and with that noise. <laughs> But it was slightly hampered by an early generation gearbox and it could be a tricky son of a bitch to handle, especially in the wet. The 430 Scuderia though improved on both these drawbacks thanks to the implementation of more advanced F1 derived systems, notably an E-diff, F1 track and a super fast 2 gearbox. 
And yet, it was still a focused, raw, naturally aspirated, screaming banshee that would lap Fiorano's test track as quickly as an Enzo and scare the bejesus out of you if you dared to turn all the electronic safety systems off. The Ferrari 430 Scuderia was announced on the 19th of July 2007 and then officially launched by seven-time F1 world champion Michael Schumacher at the Frankfurt Motor Show in September of the same year. Here he is doing just that. Remember, 2007 was Ferrari's 60th celebration year. Herr Schumacher had been instrumental in testing and developing the settings controlled by the steering wheel mounted Manatino and driving modes. He famously added the comfort dampers in race mode because he knew what many other sport car companies don't, which is that to make a truly great race car, you need a bit of lean in the suspension. Immediately you'll notice that it sits lower on its springs, 15mm lower than the standard 430 to be exact, and the overall car weighs 100 kilograms less. That's thanks to weight reduction measures like hollow front and rear anti-roll bars, titanium suspension springs and wheel nuts, lighter shock absorbers and a lighter steering box. And in terms of the bodywork, there is a lightweight composite, not carbon fibre material for the bumpers, rear diffuser, door sill covers and the aerodynamic underbody. Carbon fibre was used for the door mirrors, interior tunnel, inner door cards, the engine compartment, filter boxes and the manifold cover. And of course, the rear screen is Lexan, just like the F40 and the F8 Tributo. The Scuderia benefits from extensive aerodynamic downforce development over the standard 430 at Ferrari's own wind tunnel. Here it is. That's resulted in larger front vents, wide meshed metallic grille, lower profile bumpers and chin spoiler. It also dictated the rear spoiler and prominent rear diffuser and the high exhaust pipes based on the Challenge cars. The rear wheel arch ducts dissipate any air overpressure in the wheel arches, something Ferrari found with the FXX project. And as a result, it increases downforce by disrupting the car's wake and lowering drag. The result is that there's over 300 kilograms of downforce at maximum speed. Now, as you can see, this car is in metallic black, which is Nero Daytona in Ferrari speak, and the stripes are in silver with a black key line. This one has the optional carbon fiber right here on the front lip. You've also got a registration that looks, if you squint, like the word Tifosi. The front vents here, very characteristic of the Scud, have a split in them, whereas the 430s is just one single unit. The headlights on this one, sadly, have got a bit of a mottled effect on the lens, but I'm sure James will be sorting that out. The carbon ceramic brake discs are 398 millimeters, which is 18 millimeters larger than the standard 430. They are designed specifically to eliminate vibration when pressed to the maximum. You've got satin wheels on this one which work really well with the bright yellow brake calipers riffing off of the badge. No hand painted shields remember in the era of the 430, that came later. But I love the fact you've got this big scoop in the bottom back of the car to the rear wheel arch and you've got this real signature one up here on the flanks. This is what you can see through the wing mirror and it looks super cool as it does on the standard 430. If I was going for one I think I'd struggle to find one better than this spec right here because you've got an awful lot of optional carbon fibre, including the side skirts, which is an option that few people ticked, mainly because it was so flipping expensive. Boot space is pretty decent, as it was for all 430s and actually for the 355 as well. You can fit quite a lot of luggage in there and, as you can see, a snazzy pair of white sunglasses. Now to get into the engine compartment of the Scuderia, you pull this switch here in the back of the driver's door and it pops up. You then have to lift the engine lid, which is reasonably heavy despite the fact that it's made largely of plastic. And uh, down here we've got an engine strut to hold it open. No gas struts on this, which can obviously go wrong. You've just got a good old manual strut. That's what I like, old school. Yes, I know. I feel it too. There's something innately awe-inspiring about these more race-focused Ferrari engines and the Scud does not disappoint. As you can see, the engine is a work of art. The whole engine bay, quite frankly, which is clothed in carbon fiber. You've got a very big polished exhaust box here and most noticeable are the fact that the top of the engine then the covers and the air boxes are all carbon fiber. Looks incredible. And the V8 engine itself sits all the way 
down there and you can see the red rocker covers, the characteristic ones for Ferrari, you are looking at a 4.3 litre naturally aspirated 90 degree V8 delivering 503 brake horsepower, 510 PS, 347 foot pounds of torque, 470 newton meters, and that's enough to get you to a pulse quickening 0 to 60 time of 3.6 seconds, 124 miles an hour in 11.6 seconds, and a top speed of 198 miles an hour, which is 319 kilometers an hour. The exhaust system is a direct descendant of the 430 Challenge car and it includes resounders in the air intakes to enhance the sound of the engine. Like the F430, the Scuderia benefits from the ingenious Formula One developed e-diff or electronic differential to ensure the highest levels of grip during cornering without loss of traction. Torque is distributed between the two rear wheels by means of a stack of clutch and reaction discs controlled by a hydraulic actuator, depending on the amount of steering yaw and throttle pedal inputs. This is combined for the first time with the F1 track stability and traction control systems and ABS. It's a bit like upgrading to fiber optic cable rather than having cans connected by a piece of string. Add in the F1 Superfast 2 gearbox software, which drops change times in race mode to just 60 milliseconds, and you've suddenly got a more responsive, agile track version of Ferrari's already impressive F430. Let us also not forget that Ferrari signed off the 430 Scuderia in 2008 with the first of its racing spiders, the quite wonderful 16M. This was an open top Scuderia to celebrate 16 F1 Constructors Championships and it was a limited edition run of just 499 cars. And let's face it, one should definitely be in the car guy's garage to sit alongside the 458 Speciale Aperta and the 488 Pista Spider. The only downside, they cost twice as much as a scud, figure on at least £400,000, and they hardly ever come up for sale. And finally, the least interesting fact about the 430 Scuderia, there was even a new shade of grey developed for the grills, headlights, wheel trims and racing stripe. And now I'm inside the 430 Scuderia and immediately it is a very familiar place if you're used to a Challenge Stradale. After all, all the dials look pretty much identical and there's very similar switch gear throughout. You can see that Ferrari has tightened everything up though. Things are a little bit more professional, a little bit tacked together better. Fit and finish is a little bit better as well. And you've got this very strange ribbed for her pleasure section on the dashboard. I'm not entirely sure what that is meant to be. It obviously houses the airbag, but it's a uh, very strange design feature. You've also got a little cargo net here, which is just small enough not to fit a modern phone in, but presumably you could probably put a credit card in there, maybe, if you're lucky. Like the exterior of this car, you've got some polished carbon fiber around and obviously the entire inner door cards are carbon fiber and this looks incredible. It's the same in the Challenge Stradale, it's also the same in the Speciale and it's the same in the Pista. It's a signature move for Ferrari to put these interior doors in carbon fiber and it always takes my breath away. I absolutely love it. You can see it's a lot more stripped out in here. You've got no carpets, you've got visible bodywork all around the footwells. You've also got the Ferrari tradition of quite horrendous welds and seams everywhere. They just haven't bothered to tidy that up at all. It always makes me smile just how little care there is at the visual side. Just like the F40, just like the Challenge Stradale, it's rough as a badger's ass in here. Now this car's got no stereo in it, which is a good idea because really you just want to be entertained by the sound of the engine. What it does have are these new seats. Uh, they're a mixture of technical cloth and Alcantara, and these ones have actually got racing harnesses on them, which makes this feel even cooler and even more track focused. You've got yellow Cavallinos in the headrest to match the brake calipers and the badges on the side of the car. Everything else is pretty much done in gray or black or carbon fiber. So the interior of James's Scud is as cool as the exterior. We've got this enormous viewing window out to the engine so you can really enjoy the view back there to the carbon fiber engine bay. 
Wow, what a piece of theater that is. And you've also got technical cloth in the headlining. This car has not only the harnesses, but it also does have the half cage as well, which was an option. You've got a decent amount of storage space behind the seats on this little bench. But of course, everything is focused towards the business of driving. So I have a good size steering wheel, perhaps a little bit larger than I'm used to. It's a very strange shape as well. It's not round. On it, you've got mercifully not that many buttons because remember this is pre-458, so it's pre the time where Ferrari thought you needed to have everything on the steering wheel, a la Formula One. We just have an engine start button here, not engine start and stop just to start it. You twist the key, a conventional key, to start the car and to stop it. You then have the thing of wonder for the 430 platform, which is the Manatino, developed of course by Michael Schumacher. This has got five modes on it. You've got a sort of slippery mode winter setting at the bottom. You've then got sport, which is technically the normal mode. You've got race, and you've got CT off, and then you've got everything off. And unlike any other Ferrari that I've driven, when you actually select the options on the Manatino, you get a corresponding beep, like that. In fact, this car can't stop beeping at you. It beeps when you start it, it beeps when you play around with some of the controls, and it beeps when you took the key out of the ignition as well. Up ahead of me in the dials, we've got a central yellow rev counter, which also has a couple of digital functions to tell you what gear you're in and to give you some additional warning information. Over on the left-hand side, we've got some water and oil pressure and temperature gauges. And then over on the right-hand side, we've got the Speedo, which goes all the way up to 220 miles an hour. Although, of course, the Scuderia runs out of puff at just a smidgen below 200. It revs all the way up to 10,000, but the red line comes in at just after eight. So just from looking at that, we can tell that this is going to be a screaming engine experience. Over here on the right hand side, as with the Challenge Stradale, you've got four buttons here to control the petrol cap, the opening the front boot, uh, the fog light and the parking light. In the centre below this wonderful carbon fibre section with a 430 Scuderia badge on it, we also have the climate control section. So you've got air conditioning and you have here the direction of travel, temperature and then the speed of the fan. And also like the 360, you have an off button, which is actually the button you press to turn on the air conditioning. That actually caught me out on the manual 360 that I drove, but uh, that apparently is the air conditioning. A button marks off. It's so Italian, it's so illogical, you just couldn't make it up. Down here in the center carbon fiber tunnel, we have a manual handbrake. Just next to this F1 section, we've got three main control buttons. You've got the launch control button, which on a 430 is not a good idea in order to press or use because it completely shags the clutch. It's a little bit better on this car, but uh, on normal 430s, not so much. You've then got the button to toggle between uh, auto and manual on the paddles. So you can either let it change its own gears or you can be the master of the gear changing using paddles. And over here on this angled section, you've got the reverse gear button. And trust me, every single one of these, the R is almost always worn off. There's something about the writing that they have or the way that it's done, but uh, they're almost always worn off completely. And then down here, just finishing off on the tunnel, we've got the suspension button. Now, unlike the 355, where if you flick that button or press it, it just makes the suspension harder. In this case, it's like an early version of the bumpy road, so it actually makes it slightly softer. You've got hazard warning button here, and then this is the button to do the central locking on the car, and you've got electric mirror controls just down here, and that's pretty much it. So not a huge number of controls. I should also point out there's a plaque over there which is celebrating Ferrari's F1 Constructor World Championship in 2008. It's an awful long time ago, isn't it? Yes. About time you did it again, Ferrari, don't you think? So that's pretty much the interior of the car. The only other thing to highlight is that the first owner of this car spec'd yellow stitching with the grey Alcantara, and that's because they didn't realise that if you spec a contrasting stitching on the dashboard, that's all you can see reflected in the windscreen. So a little bit of a schoolboy error there. Uh, it's the only real downside. Everything else in this cabin is focused, it's racy, and it's superb.
can see James's car has full racing harnesses, which thanks to my recent weight loss is a lot easier to get in, a lot less eventful. So I'm quite glad for that. is through the mirror because I can see right over that carbon engine bay past the engine and out through that Lexan screen which has got one strut across it which fortunately doesn't seem to impede the view that much. One thing that's great about driving around walled little villages like this is that you can take advantage of listening to the engine bounce off the wall. So let's do that now. Here we go. Are we ready? of things to come. So let's talk about this gearbox then and um, yeah there's no getting away from it. It is much much faster than the Challenge Stradale. It is a significant improvement over that car. The change is down to 60 milliseconds. You can feel it. You can feel how fast they are and the downshifts is the fact that you don't get that big jump forward, that jolt that you get with the Challenge Stradale. That was always the pain. You'd have it in race mode in that car and you'd floor it, but you'd always have to lift off a little bit to try and smooth out those gear changes. You don't have to in this though. Now it's obviously not as quick or as seamless as the 458 or the 488. There's almost no hesitation at all and they just like bang, 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 bang. This though, you can see and feel the development as Ferrari are just gradually getting it better. In the Challenge Dali, it was one of the big downsides of the car. Pretty much everything else was perfect. The gear change wasn't and this is a significant step forward. In sport mode, it's still quite prudent to just gently lift as you make the changes, 
but certainly when you're going hard, you just don't have to anymore. But now I think it's time for some beans. James would want it, we want it, the Scud wants it, so let's unleash some second gear beans. in this are ceramic and they're big and they stop really really well again if I'm comparing between the Challenge Stradale and this car the Challenge Stradale's brakes are the greatest brakes I've ever encountered so nothing nothing beats 
Challenge Stradale brakes. These come close, but it's no cigar. <laughs> This thing is quick, even by modern standards, but you also get rawness, you get tactility, you get the fact that you can feel everything going on. That's certainly not the case in a Pista. A Pista, by comparison, is so numb. It's very fast, but you just don't get that much feeling for it. But this, this is the real deal. The engine noise is vicious. It's savage. The gear changes are quick and precise. The steering tells you everything you need to know to stay on the black stuff. It's fizzing in my hands. The car is jiggling about because it's so firm, even in race mode. Well, because you're in these bucket seats with harnesses, you're very low to the bottom of the car. You're bolted directly to the floor. And that gives you a great driving position and a great view of the road. It also means that you are completely controlling this car by the seat of your pants. Your bottom is in control. It allows you to feel every squirm and undulation. And it means if you get in trouble, you will know about it straight away and hopefully react in time. Because the steering is so quick, you probably will react in time. But I will warn you, it is a noisy long distance car, this. No wonder James has got a pair of headphones in here. So what do I like about this car then? Well, I think it's obvious. The steering, precise, balanced. The engine, a lot of grunt, the exhaust. What a noise, all the way through the rev range and especially at the top end. Just a great sounding engine. Good visibility, driver focused cabin. Very little digital nonsense going on, which I massively appreciate. It's old school and it wants you to feel old school when you drive it. It's got a decent sized boot and you can use it all the time. This feels like a real unbreakable, well put together machine. The Challenge Dale is getting on a bit now. The 328, 308, those cars, they're starting to feel like real antiques and you don't really want to take them out that much. The Scuderia though, just feels like you could take it out, thrash it, put it back in the garage and do exactly the same thing that afternoon and the next day and the next day. It feels like you could take this on the track and it wouldn't complain. And some people do. Crazy people. But one of the best things about the Scud isn't actually anything to do with the physical car. It's the fact that you can pick one up for a quite a comparatively small amount of money compared to the other hot cars. You can get one of these for anywhere between 150 and 175 thousand pounds, which considering what you get for that money, considering the Scud's place in Ferrari's history, and considering the price of Challenge Stradale's, and especially Speciale's and Pistas, this is an absolute performance bargain, and that's exactly why Chains has chosen to get one. What do I not like? Well, we're talking about small degrees here. I'm not a big fan of the look of the 430, so I don't think this car looks as good as other hot Ferraris. I can appreciate some of the touches on this car, but I just don't think I look at it in the same way as those others, and I don't think I look back at this one in the, with the same fondness either. And I think it's got a very crashy ride, particularly without the bumpy road setting on, if you're just in a normal mode. It is quite intolerably firm. <laughs> And if I'm nitpicking, the fuel gauge is about as reliable as a lookout on the Titanic. But other than that, even I have to admit that the Scud is seriously addicted. Having driven this car for a month, there is no doubt that the Scud is a great Ferrari. It's one of those old school machines that makes Ferrari such a great company, such a great builder of cars. It's got just enough old school feel to give you all of the feels, all of the trembles of classic Ferraris, but with enough modern touches to make it truly usable and manageable. If you are looking for a Ferrari that best exemplifies all the qualities that make Ferraris great and that make people talk about them, this is probably the best example you can buy. This you could drive down to the Alps at full speed, all around the twisty bits, up and down the mountains, and have the time of your life. And importantly, 
it will get you home as well. A quick history of the Ferrari mid-engined V8 then. It all started in 1973 with the Dino 308 GT4, a 2 plus 2 car demanded by Ferrari's owners Fiat in an attempt to boost the company's modest profits with a more powerful and expensive new model to sit below the V12s. The 2.9 litre V8 engine was the perfect successor to the increasingly outclassed Ferrari V6s. It was compact, had a strong power to weight ratio and therefore gave greater on-road performance. It also allowed Ferrari to charge more for it. Behold, the V8 mid-engined Ferrari was born and the 308 GT4 lasted until 1980. But no one could guess just how important and special the V8 would become for Ferrari. In 1975, the game-changing 308 GTB Vetro Racina was launched at the Paris Salon. This two-seater mid-engined V8 was designed by Leonardo Fioravanti, who also created the Daytona, and early cars had glass fibre bodies, and this was changed to steel in June 1977 to allow for the introduction of the open-top GTS model. 1980 saw a smaller engined 208 GTB and GTS made specifically for the Italian market to allow for exploitation of a tax loophole. And 1980 also saw the launch of the Mondial 8 and the Mondial Cabriolet, two new transverse V8 mid-engined 2 plus 2s, the natural successors to the 308 GT4. Ferrari needed something more potent to win back customers, so it introduced the 308 GTB and GTS Quattro Valvolve QV models in 1982. They lasted three years and helped ensure the 308 was Ferrari's most popular ever car. And the 308 formed the basis of one of the most rare and exciting modern V8 Ferraris, the 2.9-litre twin-turbocharged, fire-breathing Group B-derived GTO, produced in 1984 and 1985. Just 272 were made, but it still makes Ferrari lovers go weak at the knees, even today. With an engine increase to 3.2 litres in 1985, Ferrari unleashed the new, chunkier 328 in both GTB and GTS forms. And once again, it had a bestseller on its hands. People just couldn't get enough of them. Even today, the 328 is highly prized and well regarded among Ferrari aficionados. 1989 saw the announcement of the rakish successor to the 328, the 348 TB and TS, a 3.4 litre V8 with 300 brake horsepower and a beautiful Pininfarina body inspired by the Testarossa. Ferrari began experimenting with other variants and special editions of the 348, and 1993 saw the full-on 348 Spider and also the 348 GT Competizione, a highly prized beast. But 1994 really saw the Ferrari V8 ascend to dizzying heights with the ridiculously beautiful five valves per cylinder screaming 355, one of the highest points in Ferrari's modern history. Whether it was in Berlinetta, GTS or Spider form, the 355 was an instant sales success thanks to the introduction of the F1 paddle shift gearbox option, and the 355 is a must for any car guy collection. Five years later, the Bulbus 360 Modena replaced the 355 as the company's V8 flagship, with a 3.6-litre engine putting out 400 brake horsepower. The zenith of this engine was the Challenge Stradale Special Edition in 2003, one of the finest Ferrari sounds ever made. This F430 4.3-litre V8, which boasted 483 brake horsepower, replaced the 360 in 2004, and Ferrari settled into a pattern of launching Coupe, Spider, and Special Hot model, which has remained to this day. In fact, the F430 generation added a new category, the hot convertible model. In this case, it was the Scuderia 16M. Would I get one of these? Well, it is something I have considered. However, given what I already have in the garage and given my enjoyment of listening to proper naturally aspirated petrol engines, I think the 16M is probably the one I should go for. That's the one I think that would sit really nicely next to the 458 Speciali Aperta and the Pista Spider. And even though it's limited and even though it costs a lot of money, I actually think that's probably the one that I would prefer to have. Thank you very much for watching this episode on the 430 Scuderia. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful and entertaining. Thank you to James for lending me his precious car. 
If you like what we're doing on the car, guys, please subscribe, leave comments and likes. There'll be another episode next week.